All right, and welcome back, beloved. Today's video is titled The Satanic Nature of Anti-Semitism. And we're going to be looking from Genesis to Revelation at Satan's opposition to the nation of Israel. I started putting this video together last week. I had no idea that it was Holocaust Memorial Week or Holocaust Remembrance Day, I should say. And so I'm glad this is out now. My my goal with this video is to just equip, encourage, and edify Christians. A lot going on in the news right now. All the eyes of the world are on this little nation of Israel with a population the size of Georgia. It's about the, the state the size of Rhode Island on the eastern side of the Mediterranean Sea. And all the eyes of the world are on Israel and Jerusalem. Jerusalem right now. And I want Christians to understand how God's story plays out in the Bible and how we should react. So we're going to be looking at the satanic nature, the satanic origin of anti-Semitism. Now, you might be asking yourself, what is anti-Semitism? And so I wanted to start, I want to give you an overview of everything that's happened in Israel ever since October 7th and kind of explain what's going on in the world related to anti-Semitism. However, I want to start with just a very simple definition of terms. These terms are very important and they're quite simple. Anti-Semitism, according to Oxford Dictionary, is hostility to or prejudice against Jewish people. Very straightforward. Anti-Semitism is racism. It is hatred of Jewish people because they are Jewish. Okay? Now, whether you're on the right or the left, the vast majority of people will agree that anti-Semitism is wrong. It is a form of racism. You shouldn't hate Jewish people or be prejudiced against them just because they're Jewish. However, as you're going to see from scripture today, Satan does hate the Jewish people. And so the world needs a reason, a politically ac acceptable or politically neutral or morally neutral reason why they can justify being against the Jewish people. And the world has coined this term, anti-Zionism. I call this anti-Semitism light. However, anti-Zionism is politically correct to be. You can be anti-Zionist and not be accused of being racist. And here's what anti-Zionism is. In Merriam-Webster's dictionary, it's defined as opposition to the establishment or support of the state, very important, the state of Israel. So anti-Zionism is very tongue in cheek. You could say uh, with one hand, hey, I love the Jewish people. I'm you know, very pro-Israel, love all that. However, I don't, or not pro-Israel, I love the Jewish people, but I don't support the Jewish people being back in the promised land. I don't support the state of Israel. I don't want them to have a government. I don't want them to have a military to be able to protect themselves from another Holocaust happening. But oh yeah, I love the Jewish people. They're fantastic, right? And so that's what the world calls anti-Zionism. And I want you to understand as Christians, we need to stand up for the truth that both of these are unbiblical. Anti-Semitism is clearly unbiblical. It's racism. It's hatred. It's a sin. But anti-Zionism is unfortunately just not biblical. In Genesis chapter 12, the Lord, Yahweh, says to Abram, he will later name him Abraham, and he gives him what's known as the Abrahamic covenant. And it involves a land, the land of Israel. It involves a people, the Jewish people, and it involves a seed, which would one day be seen as the coming Messiah. But today we're talking about the land of Israel. The Lord says to Abram, go forth from your country, get out of your land, go away from your relatives, get away from your father's house, go away from your family, go to the land, which I will show you. This promise is repeated again and again and again in Genesis chapter 15. It's reiterated to Isaac. It's reiterated to Jacob. It's reiterated to the nation of Israel. It's reiterated to King David. All the prophets talked about how the nation of Israel would be scattered and then regathered back to their land. And one day they would have the full inheritance of the promised land, right? And so to this day, Christians, it's not that we support everything the state of Israel does blindly, right? If they just start nuking people tomorrow, we probably wouldn't support that. We would probably be against that. However, we should. So there are just wars, as you're going to see in a second. We should support the state of Israel. We should support them being in their land because the Bible is the word of God and it is the title deed of Israel to the Jewish people. The Bible is the title deed for the Jewish people to inherit the land of Israel, the promised land and Jerusalem. So this is the area the world is in an uproar over. Jerusalem is, you know, some of the hottest real estate on earth. 
And now understanding anti-Semitism, the hatred of Jewish people, and anti-Zionism, the hatred of a Jewish state, now I want to just kind of explain what's been going on over the last few months, right? Just give you guys kind of an overview before we break into the Bible and look at the satanic nature of all this, okay? On October 7th, 2023, just a couple months ago, this is a statement by the American Jewish Committee, okay? Hamas terrorists waged the deadliest attack on Jews since the Holocaust slaughtering babies, raping women, burning whole families alive, and taking hundreds of innocent civilians hostage. Since October 7th, more than 1,200 Israelis have been killed. Terrorists are still holding 134 men, women, and children in captivity. This happened on October 7th, and then on October 8th, the next day, Israel formally declared war on Hamas, the terror group located in the Gaza Strip, okay? Now, as of April 24th, just a few weeks ago, there is an estimate of 30 to 35,000 casualties, okay? Now, many liberal talking points, even some conservative political commentators, they will say these are civilian casualties. However, you need to educate yourself and really understand what's going on on the ground there. It is impossible to know how many civilians have lost their lives, okay? And just so you know, historically, whenever you attack a nation and you don't conquer them, they always come back and attack you, okay? that This is how wars work. Israel did not ask for this war. Uh, Hamas did not go after the Israeli military. They literally went and raped and burned civilian families alive. This is how that war started. However... The whole world is angry and accusing Israel of a disproportionate response because now there's 30 to 35,000 casualties on the Palestinian side, on the, on the Gaza Strip side. And so what I need you to understand is it's actually impossible to know, impossible, no matter what people tell you, it is impossible to know how many civilians have died in this war. Because Hamas, the terror group, they have mastered the art of embedding themselves in the civilian population. They send out rockets from kindergartens. They send out missiles and terror attacks from doctor's offices and schools. So it's impossible to know how many civilians have died versus how many terrorists have died. It's not like they're walking around wearing a uniform like an American soldier. This is a war of terror, and Hamas uses their own population as human shields. Nevertheless, tens of thousands of people have died. It is a serious war. And many civilians, I'm not, I'm not blind to the truth, many civilians have obviously died, but nobody knows the true numbers. And this is essentially how the world has reacted over the last few months. So right now, there's a massive protest movement sweeping through colleges. Uh, as of yesterday, more than 2,000 people have been arrested across more than 30 colleges, including leading, leading Ivy League schools like Columbia and Harvard. This is so dangerous because this anti-Israeli, anti-Jewish thinking, it, it's being done at Harvard and Columbia. This is where our leaders come from. This is where our the, the leaders of banks and credit unions and insurance companies and presidents and Congress, like they all come from these major campuses that are really just totally indoctrinated by liberal ideology now, by anti-biblical ideology. And so this is still going on now. It's part of the quote unquote free Palestine movement. On an international level, on the top right here, here, Israeli officials are increasingly concerned that the International Criminal Court is planning to seek arrest warrants for their military and political leaders on suspicion of war crimes. You see, this is atrocious because previously, like the International Criminal Court, they, they charge people like Vladimir Putin, who invaded Ukraine and is invading Ukraine for no other purpose but conquering their land. Muammar Gaddafi, a ruthless warlord in Libya, and the Ugandan warlord Joseph Kony, who literally killed tens of thousands of people and said he was on a mission from God as he went across his land in Africa, raping and killing people. I mean, that's, that's who they're going to start charging Israeli officials and military. I mean, that's, that, and, and this has not happened, but this is how the International Criminal Court and this is how the, the nations are responding. There, there's this global outrage. There's outrage uh, in America. There's outrage globally on international level between the United Nations and the International Criminal Court. Everyone is coming out and accusing Israel of genocide. And I want to show you in a moment the other things that are going on in the world right now 
that are far worse than what's happening in Gaza. And I just want to expose the hypocrisy of all of this. I'm not saying we should give Israel a blank check and let them do whatever they want. But what I'm telling you is Israel was attacked. They did not answer. They did not ask for this war and they are responding and they're doing their best. It appears to minimize civilian casualties. They even alert buildings before they bomb them so that the civilians can flee, which obviously means the terrorists get to flee as well. And so there, there's plenty of evidence Israel puts out showing we're not, they're not trying to kill civilians. But the world doesn't care. Here's another interesting one. The United Nations Security Council recently passed Resolution 2728. Now, this was a resolution demanding an immediate ceasefire during Ramadan, which is a Muslim holy month. And this, this resolution, it called for an immediate ceasefire. It failed to condemn Hamas. It failed to add, it called for a ceasefire, but it didn't say, hey, return 134 civilian hostages. And it, it was essentially, this resolution was seen as anti-Israeli. And this was the first time in history, this was kind of scary to watch. This is the first time the United States failed to veto something that casts Israel in a bad light. Um, I'm not saying America voted for it or America has totally turned away from Israel, but America abstained from this seemingly anti-Israeli resolution that called for a ceasefire, but didn't condemn Hamas, didn't try to get the, the civilians brought back. As, as, a, as a nation that wants to protect its people, Israel has every right to continue this war until all their hostages are brought home. Of course, of course. And so it, it was seen as a very anti-Israeli resolution. And America, for the first time, we didn't veto it. We just abstained from voting. We, we kind of played the coward. And I do worry one day that it'll go from America supporting Israel and vetoing anything that's against Israel. Israel to America abstaining and playing the coward. And one day I worry that America will be voting in favor of anti-Israeli resolution and and of of anti-Israeli resolutions. And and that is a very dangerous thing. And finally, just so you know, amidst the backdrop of all of this, Iran has attacked Israel. Hezbollah, their enemy to the north, has been attacking Israel. Hamas keeps sending rockets. So Israel is under constant attack by its enemy neighbors. Okay, Iran, for the first time in history, the government sent over missiles and drones. They were all shot down by Israel. But for the first time ever, Iran, the major nation that supports terror, that basically funds Hezbollah and Hamas, Iran sent drones and missiles over their border towards Israel. So the world is changing and a lot is happening really fast. And Israel right now, all the eyes of the world are not only on Israel, but all the eyes of the world seem to be against Israel. They have all their enemies surrounding their borders, just like the Bible predicted. The United Nations, the international courts, they all hate Israel. And of course, colleges and Americans and people given over to liberal ideology all throughout the West now are raging about Israel. And before I break this down in the Bible so that you can see how this is satanic in nature, I want to just show you how insane this is, how hypocritical this is. There are four things. There are many things I had to cut out because I don't have all day here. There are four things going on in the world right now that are just as bad or worse than what is going on in Gaza. And the world is totally silent on them. Starting at the top left here, in China, there are Muslim, this word is hard to pronounce. Many people say they're Uyghur camps. It's actually pronounced Uyghur or Weiger. There are Chinese Muslim Uyghur camps, Weiger camps, with one to two million Muslims detained right now. They are illegally imprisoned. There are confirmed reports of torture forced indoctrination, malnourishment, you name it. One to two million Muslims in China. This has been officially recognized as genocide by the United Nations, by America. This is known genocide happening in the world right now, but everyone's quiet about it. All the, all the college campuses don't want to protest about that. On the top right, we have the Russia and Ukraine war going on right now. Um, it's difficult to know the exact amount of deaths and how many are on the Russian side or the Ukrainian side, but it's somewhere between right around half a million total deaths. And this war is going on right now. And Vladimir Putin, he wasn't attacked by Ukraine like Israel was attacked by Hamas. He just went after Ukraine. And very similar amount of civilians have been killed. They estimate about 30,000 civilians in this war have been killed in Russia between Russia and Ukraine. And this is still ongoing. On the bottom left here, North Korea 
In North Korea right now, there are 12 million malnourished people. That's about one out of every two people in North Korea. 12 million malnourished people, 45.5% of the total population. Their president, Kim Jong-un, he is a brutal dictator where even if you donate money to the country, he spends it on his military. He doesn't feed his people and nobody cares. There was a famine in North Korea decades ago where if that happens again, millions of people could die. But nobody wants to protest about that. And finally, the very height of hypocrisy. In Syria, the Syrian civil war has been going on, on the bottom right here, between 2011 and right now. And in that war, Bashar al-Assad, the president of Assyria, it's estimated there have been between 350 and 500,000 deaths. These are the same type of Middle Eastern Arabs that the world is claiming Israel is committing genocide against right now. Bashar al-Assad, it's been proven he used chemical weapons against his own population, mercilessly slaughtering his own people. And that's been going on. And he's still president. And it still goes on to this day. And nobody's protesting about that. So why is everyone protesting about Israel when the casualty count is so much lower, the nation of Israel is so much smaller, and they were justly attacked and are just defending themselves? And that's where we need to get into the Bible. We need to ask ourselves the question, what does this have to do with Satan? What does this have to do with everything going on in the world? What does this have to do with Satan? The title is The Satanic Nature of Anti-Semitism, The Satanic Nature of Jew Hatred. And I've used this line a lot. It's very important. To understand the world, you must understand the word. To understand what's actually going on in the world, both right now and historically, you must understand the word of God. Satan, the devil in the Bible is described as the one, it says in 1 John, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. That is a sobering statement. The entire world is blinded and under the control of Satan, except the few who are on the narrow road. In John chapter 12, Jesus called Satan the ruler of this world. In Ephesians chapter 2, he is called the prince of the power of the air. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, we clearly see he is called the God, little g, the God of this world. And later on in this video, we're going to show you how Christ has all authority, and yet at the same time, right now, Satan is the ruler of this world. God has all sovereign authority. He's mediated that authority to Christ, his king. Therefore, Christ has all authority. However, the devil has a delegated authority until the second coming of Christ. Satan has no sovereign authority. Satan is a created being by God. He fell in the garden. God is not in some cosmic battle with Satan. God is holy. Nobody is like God. Nobody can actually challenge God. Satan does have authority. He has a delegated authority for God's reasonings and for God's perfect purposes. And Satan's authority will end at the second coming of Christ. Now, right now, he's considered the God of this world. He is the ruler of this world. And in Daniel chapter 12, regarding the Jewish nation, we see a prophecy. Daniel says, one day there's going to be a time of distress, a time of tribulation. Jesus in the New Testament would call this the great tribulation. And in Daniel, it's clearly regarding the Jewish people. And an angel is telling Daniel, there's going to be a time coming of distress, such as never occurred since there was a nation. It's going to be a time for the Jewish people far worse than the Holocaust. That's where the world is heading, and I'm going to show you that today clearly in Scripture. Anti-Semitism is going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. And in Daniel chapter 12, we read that during this time of tribulation, many are going to be purged, purified, and refined. That is the point of any tribulation, and certainly the great tribulation one day. It is to purge and purify and refine the people of God. But the wicked will act wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand. Very important. But those who have insight will understand. Those who have wisdom will understand. Children of God who understand that the Bible is the highest authority on planet Earth right now, the Word of God is the absolute highest authority, they will understand what's going on in the world related to this time of trouble, related to this time of trouble for the Jewish nation. They will understand, but the wicked will not understand. Very important. So we want to look at the satanic nature of anti-Semitism, and I want you to see the progression, okay? Satan is the god of this world. He hates the Jewish people. 
We're going to discuss, first we're going to show you that he hates the Jewish people from Scripture. Then we're going to explain why does he hate the Jewish people? Why does he hate Israel? So it's going to start with Satan. We're going to prove that. But then I want you to see it flows down to demons, fallen angels who actually have authority over the countries on earth. Right now, Daniel chapter 10 and 11 shows us there are demons, fallen angels that control world government affairs. And so nations go on blind. Finally, they're trying to fulfill their own selfish purposes, right? Like Russia invading Ukraine or Hamas attacking Israel. They're trying to fill, fulfill their own selfish, sinful pleasures. But in reality, they are blinded to the truth that Satan is using them as pawns. So we're going to see this progression from Satan's hatred of Israel to the demonic, uh, the, the fallen angels hatred of Israel to the nations. And obviously nations are made of people who ultimately will hate and continue to hate the Jewish people. And I brought up this verse and I just think it's so important. I'm, I'm not huge into application. I'm certainly not a pastor. I don't pretend to be. However, with evangelism, I think Ephesians 6 verse 12 is so important. And when I say evangelism, beloved, please open up your eyes on this with everything going on in the world right now. There is a great harvest of gospel conversations that you should be having. It, all these conversations about what's going on in Israel are so easy to flip to the gospel, so easy to flip to the authority of the word of God, to the prophecies in the Bible. It, 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 there is fruit ripe for the taking now. Don't miss out on this. This is a great time to be a Christian, beloved. The worse it gets, the better time it is to be a Christian. So when I say evangelism, I'm saying when people bring up these talking points about Israel and everything going on, there's a way to maneuver the conversation to begin talking about God and the truth and hopefully the gospel of Jesus Christ. But as you do that, this verse is huge. Ephesians chapter six says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. We are not in a war against our enemies. We do not take political stances just to hurt our enemies. We don't yoke ourselves to political endeavors. We are ambassadors of the kingdom of God. And our struggle is it's not against flesh and blood. It is against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces. He's talking about fallen angels of wickedness in the heavenly places. Paul the Apostle is saying, beloved Christian, stop getting mad at human beings. If you see someone spouting off anti-Semitism, spouting off hatred, spouting off liberal talking points, gird the loins of your mind. Settle down. Take a moment before you respond. Do not respond in anger because your struggle isn't against flesh and blood. You see, you responding in anger to someone who's blinded by Satan, blinded by fallen angels, and literally a pawn of Satan's plan against Israel, you responding in anger, it cuts off your ability to actually share the gospel with them. You don't struggle against them. You responding in anger to somebody who's blinded by Satan, that would be like America waging war against the Boy Scouts, okay? It's not befitting you, my friend. It doesn't work. You are called to engage in warfare against spiritual forces that have authority over entire nations. Not, don't get lost in the weeds. Your struggle is not against flesh and blood. When people are against the Jewish people, against God, against Christ, they have no idea what they're doing. Like Jesus said on the cross, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. They are accountable to God for everything they do. And if they don't turn to Christ, they'll be judged. And there will be plenty of justice on judgment day. But we should want mercy, even for our enemies, even for the people that are just so blind and have no idea why they're protesting. They have no idea why they're so angry at a nation the size of Rhode Island in the Middle East. They have no idea why they're angry at Israel. Remember that your struggle is not against them. It is for them and against Satan and the fallen angels that have blinded them. You are in a war for your enemies, not against them. Please don't forget that. But now I want you to see it. I want you to see it clearly in the Bible, from Satan to demons to the nations, anti-Semitism, the hatred of Israel and the hatred of the Jewish state. And this is really fascinating because you know what? The Bible doesn't have too much to say about the devil, believe it or not. You could put everything about Satan, the devil, the dragon, he's called, Lucifer, Daystar, all that, you could put it on about two pages, single spaced, and read it in about 20 minutes. I don't think you'd have a full understanding of it, but more or less, you could read everything in the Bible written about Satan in probably 20 or 30 minutes, 
And what amazes me is there's so much written about Satan's opposition to Israel and just the little bit written about Satan. It's really incredible. In 1 Chronicles 21 verse 1, we read, Then Satan stood up against Israel. He was acting in King David's time to deceive Israel into relying on themselves instead of relying on God. But that's not the point of this video. This verse just amazes me. Nowhere else in scripture do we see Satan standing against any other nation. It never says Satan stood up against the Amalekites or Satan stood up against Czechoslovakia or America or Switzerland. No, no, no. Satan stands against Israel. That is clear from scripture. Later on in Zechariah chapter 3, there's a great vision, and it's a complex vision. It's not something we're going to break down right now, but I just want you to see the main point here. In Zechariah chapter 3, Zechariah sees a vision of Joshua the high priest, and he's standing before the angel of the Lord, who is a pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ, and Satan is standing at his right hand to accuse him. But my friends, Satan is not merely accusing Joshua. Joshua is a high priest, and the high priest represented the nation of Israel before God. That's what a priest does. Jesus, right now, he's a high priest. He represents all Christians before God. Joshua was the high priest of Israel in the Old Testament, in the book of Zechariah. And Zechariah, he sees this vision. The angel of the Lord, Jesus Christ, is on the left, and then Joshua is there, and then on the right of Joshua, Satan is at the right hand of Joshua, accusing him. But it's not really about Joshua, because the Lord responds to Satan, and he says, the Lord rebuke you, Satan, indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem. See, it's not just about Joshua, it's about Jerusalem. And Yahweh, I believe a pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ, responds to the accuser and says, no, no, no. This is a brand plucked from the fire. This is a people meant for grace, and I am not going to totally destroy them like the other nations. So we see Satan standing against Israel. And as Satan stands against Joshua, the high priest, he's standing against the one who represents Israel and represents Jerusalem before the Lord. And Satan stands against them once again in the Old Testament. Revelation chapter 12, we're going to break this down in detail today. I don't, I don't want to do it right now. I'm going to do it in just a few moments, but it's incredible. With the very li little written in the Bible about the devil, Revelation 12 is an entire chapter where if I were to summarize it, it's essentially Satan hates Israel. I mean, the entire chapter, Revelation 12, is about the ancient roots of satanic anti-Semitism. It's an incredible, very mysterious, interesting chapter of the Bible. We're going to break it down on a high level in a moment, but Suffice to say, it is clear in Scripture, Satan stands against Israel. But then we also see that with the demons and the nations. You see, in Revelation 16, just to give you some insight, in Revelation chapter 16, we read of spirits of demons, and they perform signs. They go out to the kings of the whole world. These demons who have authority over the nations, they go out, they perform miraculous signs. And just to give you some context, this is all the way at the end of the tribulation. This is just before the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is after the blowing of all seven trumpets. We don't know the exact day or month. I'm not going to get a graph of the time frame of the tribulation out, but this is towards the end of the tribulation. And these demonic spirits, they go out, they perform signs. They go to the leaders, the kings of the entire world. And this is what they do. They gather them together for the war of the great day of God, the almighty. This is what's known as Armageddon in eschatology, Armageddon in the study of the end times. We read these demons, they go out, and they gather all the nations to the place which in Hebrew is called Har Megiddo. Har means plain. Megiddo is the plain of Megiddo. It's just the plain of Megiddo. Har Megiddo. That's where we get the term Armageddon. Megiddo. It is the plain of Megiddo. Stop this video. Google it right now. It is a real place. The Bible speaks about real places. It's a real book. The plain of Megiddo, Napoleon said, was the finest battlefield he'd ever seen. It's hundreds of miles, just flatlands, and it just stretches out and out and out. And at the end of time, or before the second coming of Christ, all the nations are going to gather against Israel and Jerusalem, and they're going to be led there by Satan through the mediation of his demons, his fallen angels. They're going to gather all the nations to the plain of Megiddo, just outside and in Israel, as a staging ground for millions of soldiers who are getting ready to rush upon and finally destroy Israel, just like Satan's always been trying to do. 
The nations also. So we see the satanic hatred of the Jewish people in Israel. We see the demons towards the second coming of Christ. They're going to gather all the nations to Israel to destroy her. And then we see it obviously with the nations in Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12 through 14, it very clearly shows us how the world ends. And one thing I love about being a Christian, I mean, I feel like Abraham before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, God literally looked at Abraham and he said, should I hide from Abraham anything I'm doing? Should I hide it from him? I mean, he's, he's my child. Abraham's my friend. As I read the Bible, I get very happy uh, because God has shared these awesome secrets with us, right? And you can get lost in the weeds and focus on stuff you shouldn't all the time. But if you just stay in the Bible, it's really cool to me. God has revealed to me how the world ends. It, it, not every little detail, but a lot of details, more details than we need. I'll tell you that much. And in Zechariah chapter 12, it's just incredible. We read of how the world ends. You ever want to know like, oh, people write books. How's the world going to end? This is how it ends. Read Zechariah chapter 12 to 14. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 3, all the nations of the earth will be gathered against Jerusalem. My friends, that's how the world ends. Satan and the demons gather the nations against Jerusalem. In Zechariah chapter 12, it says, in that day, I will set about to destroy. The Lord will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. This is how the world ends, my friends. And so we see clearly the satanic opposition to the state of Israel the demonic opposition to the state of Israel, and how all the nations one day, this is the course the world is heading on. I'm sorry to say, anti-Semitism is not going to get better. It, it's going to get worse. And that's just what the Bible says. All the nations will one day gather against Jerusalem to destroy them. Okay? Now, I want to answer this question. Why does Satan hate Israel? I mean, we've seen very clearly from Scripture, Satan hates Israel, Satan hates the Jewish people, Satan is certainly anti-Zionist, he doesn't want the Jewish people back in Jerusalem. Why? Why? We need an answer for this. And there are many reasons that I would consider true, but not sufficient. True, but not sufficient. In Zechariah chapter 2, we read that Israel is the apple of God's eye as a nation. And beloved, you should take heart as an individual. If you believe in Jesus Christ, if you're saved, if you're a disciple, you're the apple of God's eye. You're a saint. But Israel is the apple of God's eye corporately as a nation, right? You individually, you are the apple of God's eye. I don't want to take away anything from the church, but this is a teaching about Israel. Zechariah chapter 2, Israel as a nation is the apple of God's eye. They, he found them in Egypt. He saved them from slavery. He brought them through. No matter how many times Israel turns away from him, they reject him. They cheat on him. They try to kill him. They kill Jesus Christ. No matter what, he will always have a remnant of Jewish people. And one day he's going to redeem the entire nation because he is a good and loving and merciful God. So why does Satan hate Israel? You could say he hates what God loves, right? He's a murderer. He's also a usurper. He wants authority. He actually wants to control God's creation. He wants to be the God in a creation, not his own. He is a rebel. He's literally encouraged humanity to join him in rebellion against our own creator. And he seeks to thwart the plans and the purposes and the prophecies and the promises of God. He wants to thwart God's word and prove him a liar. All of these are true, but they're not really sufficient, at least for me. I got to dig a little deeper. I got to know just a little bit more. Why does Satan hate Israel so much? I need a specific reason. And in Revelation chapter 12, you get that reason. And it is very clear, my friend. In Revelation chapter 12, you have the entire history of anti-Semitism. It's a wonderful chapter. It starts in eternity past and it goes to the fall of Lucifer and it goes all the way to the future end of the tribulation. So it's really incredible. In Revelation 12, we have a vision and the vision is of a woman and the dragon. And if you follow my channel, you know, I love visions. I love Daniel and I love Zechariah and the four beasts and the four horns and the statue, any vision of the Bible. I just love them. I love figuring out the visions and the parables of the Bible and how they all reinforce the doctrines and the teachings of the Bible and Jesus Christ. I like taking complex things and making them very simple. Okay. And that's what I'm going to attempt to do here. In Revelation 12, we have the history of the satanic nature of anti-Semitism, and we have a vision of a woman and a dragon. And I believe, if I can do this properly, if you will study this chapter or just listen today, we will see why the true reason Satan hates Israel. So check this out. 
In Revelation 12, it begins, this vision, a great sign appeared in heaven. Okay, and I underline the word sign because many people will tell you all of Revelation is just visions and murky talk. We can't really understand if it's all literal. This is specifically described as a sign, a vision, okay? Whereas the rest of Revelation, it's just described as fact. Like in Revelation uh, chapter 6, it says one third of the world died, and then a famine came, and then earthquakes came. It's very straightforward. It doesn't say that's a vision, but then in Revelation 12, it specifically, the Holy Spirit specifically delineates, this is now a vision with a literal interpretation of that vision, but it is a vision. He's not actually, there's not actually going to be a great woman in the sky during the tribulation. So John, he's seeing this vision in Revelation chapter 12, and he sees a great sign that appears in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head, a crown of 12 stars. It's so important that we understand who the woman is because it unlocks the meaning of the whole vision. And it'll become clear later on in Revelation chapter 12. But here's what I want to show you, my friends. In Genesis chapter 37, it reveals who this woman is. In Genesis chapter 37, Joseph, one of the brothers of the 12 tribes of Israel, he has a dream. He has a dream, and in that dream, he sees the sun and the moon. Just like in Revelation 12, there's a vision, just like a dream, with the sun and the moon. And Joseph, one of the 12 tribes of Israel, right, one of the 12 sons of Jacob, he has this dream, and he sees 11 stars bowing down to him. You see, Joseph, he is the 12th star, and his father Jacob is the sun, and his mother is the moon. And Joseph was going to lead them out of famine and all of that into Egypt, obviously, right? However... I love how the Lord has put together the Bible in that if you want to understand Revelation, you have to understand the whole Bible. You have to understand Genesis to Revelation. You have to have some understanding of it. And then then it kind of unlocks itself. It's incredible. In Revelation 12, we see a woman. She's clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars. The 12 stars are the 12 sons of Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel. The woman is Israel. It is the nation of Israel. Israel. It is very clear by looking at Joseph's dream and then seeing the woman. It's going to become more clear as we go. We need to delineate these two characters. Who is the dragon and who is the woman? Because then the vision explains itself. In Revelation 12, we see then another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon. It's pretty easy to figure out who the dragon is. He's Satan because in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, we hear of the great dragon being thrown down to the earth. He's described as the serpent of old who is called Satan. So scripture just reveals very plainly in Revelation 12, the dragon is Satan and the woman is is Israel. Therefore, the vision of Revelation 12, it's all about Satan and Israel. It's about Satan's relationship with, to Israel. So, so, so important, my friends. In verse 12, we read that the dragon, Satan, has great wrath. And in verse 13, we read that Satan, the dragon, persecutes Israel, the woman. And in verse 17, we read that the dragon is enraged. Satan is enraged with Israel, with the woman. The dragon is enraged with the woman. And as you study this chapter, we are going to see why. Why is Satan in such animosity towards Israel? And here it comes, my friends. It's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. That, and I'm not making this up. I'm not digging very far here. It's very straightforward. Revelation chapter 12, verse 2. Why does Satan hate Israel? The woman is with child. The woman, Israel is with child. It's talking about the coming Messiah. You're going to see that in a second. The dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. Satan stood before Israel so that he might devour her child. This is talking about anti-Semitism before Christ was born. You see, the very nation of Israel was always subject to attempted genocides. Multiple times in the Bible, nations tried to wipe out Israel. In fact, Pharaoh when he heard about Moses, uh, excuse me, Pharaoh, when Israel was growing while they're still in slavery to Egypt, he tried to kill all the firstborn sons. And you see how Pharaoh, he's blinded by Satan. Pharaoh is acting to preserve his authority as king of Egypt, as Pharaoh of Egypt. And he has no idea that what is really happening by him slaughtering all the firstborn sons and all the sons is that Satan is trying to kill the Messiah. He's trying to devour 
the child that Israel will bear. Haman, the entire book of Esther in the Old Testament is all about one man, Haman, trying to annihilate the Jewish nation. And he's blinded. He's satanically blinded. He's just trying to maintain his authority. And he actually wants to be bowed down to and worshiped himself. And because the Jews won't do that, he wants to annihilate the nation. But in reality, it's Satan trying to destroy Israel before the Messiah could be born. The Greek tyrant Antiochus Epiphanes, he slaughtered 80,000 Jewish people. And he was just acting in the same way as Pharaoh and Haman. But Satan was trying to destroy the Jewish nation before the Messiah could be born. There was a captivity in Assyria with the northern tribes. And then the Babylonian captivity of the southern tribes, Jerusalem and Judah. These are all satanically inspired plots to annihilate the Jewish people before the Messiah could be born. It's so clear when we study the Bible, history begins to make sense. Why does the world historically and now hate the Jewish people? Revelation 12 verse 5 says, despite all of this, despite Satan's many, many, many attempts to annihilate the Jewish nation before she could give birth to a Messiah, she gave birth to a son. She gave birth to the Messiah. And I love this. The Holy Spirit gives us even more information, not just a son, a male child, okay? It wants to be, the Holy Spirit wants to be very sure that you don't take this and make it whatever you think it means. No, it is a son, a human being, a male child, and this son is to rule. He is to have authority over all the nations with a rod of iron. It's quoting Psalm 2. You'll see that in a moment. And her child is caught up to God and to his throne. That is talking about the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. After he was resurrected, he ascended and he is sitting at the right hand of the throne of God right now. So despite all the efforts of Satan, Israel gave birth to the Messiah. And this is why Satan hates Israel. You see in Genesis chapter three, after Satan brought the human race into his rebellion against God, In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God is literally speaking to and cursing Satan. And God tells Satan, there's coming a child. It's a he, it's a boy, it's a seed, it's an offspring. A human being is coming and he will bruise you on the head. That Hebrew word means crush. There is coming a son one day, Genesis 3, 15. There's coming a male child one day, an offspring, and he is going to crush your head, devil. And so as God began to separate the nation of Israel from the other nations, and he began to prophesy that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem and that he would be from the tribe of Judah and that he would be from the Jewish people, Satan has always been trying to annihilate the Jewish people so that the Messiah could not be born. That's the reason. The devil's hatred for Israel is because they are the nation the Messiah came through. In Romans chapter 9, Paul describes the Israelites as those from whom Christ, according to the flesh, came who is overall God. You see, Satan understood in the garden that God was going to be born. God was going to take on human flesh one day, and he was going to be born, and the Messiah was going to come. The God-man was going to come and crush the devil, and that's why Satan hates Israel. However, That doesn't really answer the question of why Satan hates Israel now. Why did Hitler try and annihilate the Jewish people? Why? Why is this still going on to this day? Because Christ has been born. Christ has ascended to the right hand of God. Why does Satan still clearly hate Israel? Why will he persecute them in the tribulation? Why is he trying to annihilate them right now? Because not only is Israel the nation the Messiah came through, they are also the nation the Messiah will come back to. He's coming through Israel, and he's coming back to Israel. Zechariah chapter 14, remember Zechariah 12 to 14 clearly shows you how the world ends? We read, in that day, his feet, the feet of Yahweh, will stand on the Mount of Olives. Here's a picture of it. I love pulling up these pictures of Mount Zion with the temple, and over here is the Mount of Olives. On this day, at the second coming of Christ, Jesus comes back to Jerusalem. He doesn't come back to Switzerland. He doesn't come back to Africa or Australia or New York City. He comes back to Jerusalem, to the Mount of Olives. Paul said in Romans chapter 11, then all of Israel will be saved. There will be a massive Jewish revival at the second coming of Christ. They will look on the one they've pierced. And Paul said, this is written in the book of Isaiah, the deliverer, the savior, the Messiah will come from Zion. Right here, beloved, 
The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. He'll remove ungodliness from Israel. The Messiah is coming back to save Israel one day. A great revival will happen for that nation. So Israel is the nation the Messiah came through. They're the nation the Messiah will come back to. And they are the nation the Messiah will reign with during the millennial kingdom. Very important. When Christ comes back, he will usher in a time, a 1,000 year period of peace and prosperity all throughout the earth. It won't be heaven. It will be similar to the Garden of Eden. It won't be heaven. It won't be absolute perfection. It will be a time of blessings for the nations. And during that time, Jesus, the King of the Jews, he will reign from Jerusalem and Israel will have authority with him. And so will the church. The church will also have authority. In Zechariah chapter 14, it's written, it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that went against Jerusalem after the battle of Armageddon, after all the nations come against Jerusalem and Christ comes back to destroy them, it will come about that any who are left will go up from year to year during the thousand year reign of Christ on earth And they'll go up to Jerusalem and they'll worship the king, the Lord of hosts. You see, the reason we know this is talking about the millennium is because during this time frame, Egypt and some other countries and nations, they're going to be disobedient and they're not going to go up to worship the Lord and the Lord will actually punish them with no rain. You see, the Holy Spirit gives us all these details of the second coming of Christ so we can line them up with Revelation and see that Jesus, he is going to take us to heaven one day and the new Jerusalem, eternity, but he's coming back to reign upon the earth for a thousand years, okay? In Isaiah chapter 9, we read of the God-man coming. A child is coming who will be almighty God. And we read, he's a great king. There's no end to the increase of his government or of peace. Jesus is coming back to set up a great government that rules the earth and all the nations with a rod of iron. And it's written of this God-man in Isaiah 9. He sits on the throne of David. You see, there's going to be a rebuilt temple right here, a millennial temple, and the throne of David, Jesus Christ, who is in the lineage of David. He's the son of David. He's the rightful king of the earth because God set up authority through the line of Judah. So Jesus has God as all authority, but Jesus as man, he has a regal and royal authority over the earth and over the nations. And one day he will exercise that authority over the nations when he sits on the throne of David in Jerusalem. So Satan hates Israel because they're the nation the Messiah came through. They're the nation the Messiah is coming back to, and they are the nation he will reign with for a thousand years. Now, moving on, it goes further than this, though. This is about authority. We read back in Revelation 12 that heaven and the saints and the angels are praising the Lord, and they say, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah have come for the accuser of our brethren. The authority of Christ is coming. The kingdom of Christ is coming, and it is against Satan. You see, this is all about authority and a kingdom. In Revelation 12, we read that the devil has great wrath. And we're trying to understand why. Why is the devil so angry? And in Psalm, at Israel, and in Psalm chapter 2, we read, why do the nations rage? You see, Revelation 12 quotes Psalm 2, that the Messiah comes back to rule with a rod of iron. But in Psalm 2, it doesn't say, why does Satan rage? It doesn't say, why does the devil rage? It says, why are the nations so angry? Why is everyone protesting? Why is everyone so angry? And in Psalm chapter 2, it gives us the reason. God gives the nations his response. The nations are enraged. They're trying to dethrone God. They're against God and against his Messiah in Psalm chapter 2. And God responds to the nations and he says, I have installed my king upon Zion. God has installed his king, the ruler, the royal lineage of David. He will sit on the throne of David and he will install him upon Zion. He furthermore says that this king is his own son. He is the son of God, and he has given him the nations as an inheritance to rule with a rod of iron. Christ has all authority. However, I need to answer this question. How can God and Christ have all authority and Satan still be the little G God of this world, my friends? Very important question to answer. In Revelation chapter 11, we get the when. 
When is all this going to happen? When is Jesus coming back? When is Jesus going to sit on David's throne, usher in a time of peace and blessing, end the, end the satanic rebellion of the nations, and usher in this time of peace and blessing? When is this going to happen? Oh Lord, Maranatha, when are you coming? In Revelation 11, we hear that the seventh angel sounds his trumpet. This is toward the very ends of the tribulation, the very almost right before the second coming of Christ. And we read of loud voices in heaven, the angels praising God, saying, the kingdom of the world has become, future tense, it will become one day the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And furthermore, they say, we give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty. You were, you, you are, you are to come because you've taken your great power and have begun to reign. You see, right now, if you are a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, Christ reigns as sovereign o- over your heart. Your heart is the throne of Jesus Christ, and that's why you are no longer a slave to your sins, okay? But Jesus, he has not taken his, that same authority that rules you, he has not taken his kingdom and exercised that authority over the nations of the earth. Satan is still the little g God of of this world, the ruler of this world, and the nations are blinded to his rule. And so the nations don't want to lose their authority. And Satan doesn't want to lose his authority. And Christ is coming back one day, and the kingdom of the world will finally, he will exercise his rule over it, just as he exercises his rule over your heart with absolute sovereign authority. So why does Satan hate Israel? They're the nation the Messiah came through. They're the nation the Messiah is coming back to and the nation the Messiah will reign with. And Satan seeks to preserve his kingdom and authority. And one final reason, and this is so important, this is a great apologetic, this is good for evangelism. Revelation 12 ends with the dragon is enraged at the woman. Satan is enraged against Israel because he cannot destroy her. And he goes off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God. And this is huge hold to the testimony of Jesus. You see, Revelation 12 is all about the dragon and the woman, Satan and Israel, and it literally ends with the name Jesus. Satan hates Israel because of Jesus, and specifically the testimony of Jesus. That word testimony is huge, huge. In Revelation 19, we read that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. All revelation from God is pointing you toward Jesus. Any singular truth in scripture, if followed like a trail, like a narrow way, will lead you to Jesus Christ. If you follow the law, you will realize you're a sinner and you need Jesus Christ. If you follow the prophets, you will realize they prophesied a lamb was coming to die for sinners and it will lead you to Jesus Christ. All prophecy points you to Jesus Christ. It is truth. The Bible is the truth, and Satan is the father of lies. So we read in Revelation 12 that Satan makes war with those who have the testimony of Jesus. You see, Revelation 19 as well, it ties in. That word testimony, it means witness, but it even goes further than that. It it essentially means evidence. Satan hates anything that provides evidence of Jesus Christ. That's what Satan hates. And the nation of Israel is a constant witness to the veracity of Scripture. This is why Satan hates Israel right now. The nation of Israel being preserved by God and not destroyed is a constant witness to the veracity and truth of Scripture. And Scripture points you towards Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 9, I'll go quickly here, Paul says the Israelites, to them belong the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple service, the promises, theirs are the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and from them, from the Jewish people, the Christ came, the Messiah, according to the flesh. You see, Paul, like 99% of the Bible is written by Jewish people. Jesus said salvation is of the Jews. You see, in the Old Testament, God gave Israel covenants. He promised to give Abraham the promised land ruled by the nation of Israel. He reiterated that promise to David, and he added that from David's lineage, the final king, the Messiah, would come. The law given to Israel points towards the absolute necessity of a sacrifice for our sins. That's why they were sacrificing all the lambs. The law also prophesies both the preservation and the tribulation of the Jewish people. In Deuteronomy chapter 27 to 32, the preservation of the nation of Israel, that they wouldn't be destroyed, they'd be gathered back, but also the tribulation, that they would undergo horrible judgments for breaking God's law. And in the latter days, they would understand it and turn back to God. 
the temple service foreshadows the sacrifice of Christ. For thousands of years before Jesus is born, every morning and every evening, they're sacrificing a lamb. That's why when John the Baptist sees Jesus, he says, behold, the lamb of God. And finally, the promises. The promises given to the nation of Israel include the preservation and final regathering of the state. You see, the existence of the Jewish people back in their land is proof that God still has a plan for them. If the Jewish people were completely destroyed, it would prove that the Bible cannot be trusted. So, so why does Satan hate Israel? Satan hates the nation because the Messiah came through them. The Messiah is coming back to them and he will reign with Israel for a thousand years. They will have authority. And Satan seeks to preserve his kingdom and authority. And number three, Satan seeks to destroy the evidence concerning scripture, any testimony or evidence concerning scripture, God, and most of all, Jesus Christ. And my friend, here is Satan and Satan's end game. This is the purpose of all of it. Second Corinthians 4, 4, we read of Satan as the God of this world, and he has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. You see this? This is what Satan is doing. Everything Satan is doing is meant to point you away from Jesus Christ, away from the truth of scripture, away from the evidence of Jesus. Because if scripture is true, then the Jewish God is the one true God. And if the Jewish God is the one true God, then the Jewish Messiah is the only hope for the human race. The Jewish scriptures are clearly true. God has preserved the state of Israel. The whole world hates Israel just as Satan does. And if the whole world would just open their eyes, they would see they are sinners against a holy God and they need a sacrifice for their sins. And God has provided that for them in the Jewish Messiah. Satan ultimately hates and seeks to destroy anything that gives clear evidence to the truth concerning God, the evidence concerning Jesus, scripture. Most importantly, he seeks to disprove Jesus Christ. This is why he hates the nation of Israel, because the deliverer, the Messiah, will come back to Zion one day. This is why he also hates all true believers in Jesus Christ, as we have the testimony, we have the evidence of Jesus Christ, my friends, that he has saved us. And in conclusion, I'll just go very quickly. Here's just one of dozens of promises. Jeremiah 30, the Lord speaks to Israel and says, I am with you, declares the Lord to save you. I will destroy completely all the nations where I've scattered you. Only I will not destroy you completely. Look at all the nations that have oppressed Israel in the past. Israel's always been the underdog from the time of Egypt to the Amorites, the Amalekites, the Perizzites, the Philistines. When God led Israel to the promised land, he says, I'm giving you this land with seven other nations who are stronger than you. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, the attempted genocide of Haman, the Greek tyrant Antiochus Epiphanes, the Roman siege of Jerusalem, the scattering to the nations, the very Holocaust itself makes only makes sense when we look at it through the lens of scripture. The Holocaust, six million Jews butchered. Hamas attacking Israel a few months ago. Hezbollah probably showering Israel with rockets today, and Iran supporting all of this. Israel always withstands. She's the bush that does not burn, for God is in her midst. The Jewish people, my friends, even if you ask atheists, they are a sociological cultural anomaly that a nation would preserve its cultural roots and be separate from all the nations for thousands of years and not be destroyed. You can't meet an Amalekite. You can't meet an Amorite. God promised to blot out their name forever. But he promised, I will not destroy the nation of Israel completely. This is proof positive of the veracity of scripture that you can trust scripture and that you must turn to Jesus Christ, who is the God of the Bible. God bless you all, my friends. And in closing, we should all pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Even though we know true peace will not come until the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, we should pray for the peace of Jerusalem because at the second coming of Christ, we will have that peace. And so we should be praying for the Lord to come back and save his people. God bless you all and have a great day.